to introduce our panel today. Uh, we have first and foremost Dr. Joseph Kerwin, uh, who is currently an associate professor of neurology and space medicine across the street at the Baylor College of Medicine and a space medicine advisor at the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Kerwin is a medical physician and was the first medical doctor to practice in orbit. He, uh, he was an astronaut aboard the fairly infamous Skylab 2 um, mission. And for those of you who might be younger, I'm sure he can fill us in on some of the details about what transpired. Uh, he's also no crimes were committed. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's also served as the Director of Space and Life Sciences at NASA's Johnson Space Center and is currently a consultant extraordinaire, would you say, for private sector aerospace. Uh, next we have Dr. Scott Perzinski, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Antarctica Program at the University of Texas Medical Branch down in Galveston. Uh, he's an avid traveler, climber, summited Everest a few years back, uh, scuba diver, and also pilot who has been on five space shuttle missions and has performed over seven uh, EVAs or spacewalks for the, the lay among us. Uh, he also has numerous faculty positions and appointments at Oxford, Stanford, UTMB. Am I forgetting any? I forgot. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> Uh, and he consults for Virgin Galactic as well. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Neil Pellis, who is currently the director of the Division of Space Life Sciences at the University Space Research Association, USRA. He uh, was formerly senior scientist of Space and Life Sciences Directorate at NASA Johnson Space Center as well. Uh, PhD in microbiology at Miami University in Ohio. I never quite understood that. Um, That's the original Miami. It existed as a Miami. Okay. Miami Indians were there before they were anywhere else. So there you go. <laughs> uh, and he, too, has a number of faculty positions and appointments at Northwestern, UTMB, Rice, and am I forgetting any? There's probably a couple more in there. Uh, he led NASA's biotechnology cell science program uh, and has a special expertise in microgravity. So I have a few, more than a few questions actually, to try and get discussion started. Uh, but if you have any burning questions, feel free just to raise your hand. However, we're going to block off at least the last 15 minutes uh, to solicit questions from the audience. So to get it started, um, for the astronauts, how long was your training and what was a normal training day like? Sure. There you go. Age before beauty, right? Uh, Indeed. Yeah. Our, <laughs> our answers to training will probably vary a lot because we came from different eras of the program. When I arrived at NASA, it was 1965, uh, with the first so-called scientist astronaut group, and uh, uh, there was a lot of travel involved. They, uh, they uh, handed us a, uh, a uh, thick book of travel vouchers, and all you had to do was go to an airport give them a travel voucher, a U.S. government NASA travel voucher, and uh, you could fly wherever you wanted to. But of course, our preference was to uh, uh, call Ellington Field and reserve a T-38 for uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, and zoom off on your own, which we also did a lot of. Uh, so training involved uh, a little bit of book learning, uh, several field trips, principally uh, studying geology. This is before the moon landing. And they didn't care who you were or whether you were going to the moon. If you were an astronaut, you were going to get geology training. And you were going to get survival training. We did Arctic survival, jungle survival, desert survival. We had more fun uh, on, on these trips than, than you could imagine. And when that training, which took about a year, was over, then you got technical assignments supporting Apollo crews or Apollo hardware. In my case, it was the spacesuit. Uh, and, uh, and did that for nearly f more than five years. Uh, until I actually got my crew assignment on Skylab. Oh, lost the microphone here. Well, those travel vouchers explain all that training you did in Bora Bora, I guess. But, um, yeah, so it's a little bit different for me. I started in uh, 1992 as a shuttle astronaut, and so um, 
there's really, as you know, no microgravity room where we can go and, and train end-to-end -end the things that we'd be doing on our shuttle or our space station flight. So it's kind of an integrated uh, approach to preparing for our mission. So we had book learning, lectures, field trips, but um, simulators, uh, high fidelity uh, representations of uh, the shuttle and the space station, including motion-based simulators that we would use that would rock and roll like the shuttle um, uh, on ascent and landing. Uh, we had uh, a neutral buoyancy facility, the largest pool in the world, uh, indoor pool in the world is uh, down in Clear Lake. I encourage you to see it if you get a chance to, to visit the Johnson Space Center, but we would practice all the, the intricate details of our spacewalks. We had different simulators, uh, physical as well as virtual reality simulators to practice our robotic trajectories, the things that we'd be flying, also the, the rendezvous and docking with the space station. And then, um, depending on the payloads that we'd be flying, uh, including a number of medical things, we would go to the, the universities where they were initially prepared and meet with the science uh, teams there and, and learn the nuances of, of the, what we'd be doing in space for them. We're, we're kind of uh, surrogate principal investigators for the, the science teams uh, on orbit. So it was really a lot of fun, uh, you know, getting to, to work with your, your crew and, and traveling, but uh, also just working in these different environments, none of which completely represented what you'd be doing on orbit, but you would integrate it in your head and, and get a, a sense of what it would be like. Some, some very long hours, uh, but uh, we would uh, typically assign a crew about a year, year and a half before a mission. Uh, the, the initial astronaut candidate training took about a year uh, when you uh, were then eligible to be assigned to a flight and then when you got a, a shuttle flight assignment it was about a year, year and a half. So Dr. Pellis, the, uh, the next question will start with you. Uh, given the current state of NASA and your special expertise in microgravity, about how much time feasibly before we or we as in the United States or a multinational effort uh, will be capable of launching a long-term manned spaceflight mission to Mars? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 what determines what you can do anywhere you go, even this room, is actually the energy that you can actually accumulate or generate. And so, obviously, we have a couple of obstacles when we look at Mars. In a current scenario right now with the capabilities that we have uh, and the propulsion systems that we have at hand, we'd be looking at, at a minimum six month trip to Mars at a specific time when we could actually make that trip. And then we'd have to stay on Mars for about 573 days, which has one third the gravity of the Earth. And then we could return on another essentially six to seven month mission back to the Earth. And realistically looking at that, <coughs> now and saying, you know, would we want to risk trying that, uh, we'd have a lot of considerations, a whole lot of considerations, a lot of them logistical, and I won't it to take too long and I won't take that much time, but, but just think about it for a second, how do you pack a lunch, okay, or how do you pack a picnic basket for a 30-month trip, okay? It's 16 metric tons of food, just the food alone. We're not talking about the water. And can you get water there? Well, we don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. So you've got to think about those kinds of things. And everything that you use every day, how many toothbrushes you're going to need? What are you going to do? How about clothes? You know? yeah. you, how, how do you pack? Do you pack clothes? Do you reprocess clothes? If you're going to reprocess, how are you going to reprocess them? So all of those logistics have got to be worked out. And so there's no instant gratification like you get in Star Wars or Star Trek, and we're going to be leaving tomorrow. I, you know, to make a prediction, an actual prediction of a date, I think realistically, you know, in, 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 with, with a number of compacted miracles occurring, you know, within short periods of time from each other, you might do it in 2025, okay? But I see, you know, if you, if you had to make a bet on that, you may as well go buy a lottery ticket, you'll be a millionaire the next morning, okay? <clears throat> so I think that realistically we're looking at post-2030. Uh, at, at making that kind of mission. And perhaps by then, we would be better with regard to our propulsion systems. And if we are, the trip is shorter, okay? And we may even be able to get to a point where we don't have to ride the planet for 570 some days before we can come back. And if you need an explanation of why that is in the question and answer period, you can ask me. I agree with everything Neil said. I would, I would just, uh, in terms of the human bodies, uh, capacity to, to make the trip, there are some significant challenges. We've, we've learned a lot in low Earth orbit how to 
maintain the musculoskeletal and cardiovascular system, but the biggest threat that we haven't been able to, to really protect against is radiation. Um, so when you're outside of the Earth's magnetic field, you're exposed to galactic cosmic radiation and, and the solar wind and, and other things that, uh, in a very short order, if there were a, a major solar storm, uh, could prove fatal. So uh, following on what Neil said, there is a technology uh, being developed by one of uh, my former colleagues, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz, which is called the Vasimir. It's a plasma ion engine that would be powered by nuclear reactors, uh, but the, the benefits of this system are that you would have continuous acceleration out to Mars, so you could potentially shorten this trip to 90 days or maybe even less, so your window of exposure to radiation would be less. And secondarily, the, the nuclear reactors that would be positioned around the crew compartment could actually create a magnetic field, so basically create your own Van Allen belt around the crew compartment and potentially uh, shield the crew from uh, you know, lethal radiation. So it, it, it sounds a little bit like science fiction now. There's a lot of work to be done. I agree it's not going to happen overnight. When you put that question to us in an email, my, uh, I jotted down an answer, which is, whenever we decide to go, plus 10 years. Uh, meaning you've got to have the program approved. You've got to say, this is it, it's time to go to Mars, let's, uh, uh, let's get people on contract and build spacecraft and, uh, and get into serious planning. Uh, to do that, and I think medically that we could do that now, if we get a phone call during the session, the 10-year clock starts, okay, uh, that uh, we would have to take some significant risks. And, and you have laid out what some of those risks are. Radiation is probably the biggest one. Uh, but there are various ways in, in which you can mitigate the radiation risk. Uh, one is by uh, selecting older crew members. Uh, there's no secret why I'm in favor of that. Uh, and, uh, uh, because the latent time, the, there, you know, the, there are two radiation threats in spaceflight, an acute one, radiation sickness, possible death, for example, on the surface of the moon, uh, uh, 20 miles away from your lunar module or your, uh, or your habitat, uh, and uh, a massive solar particle event occurs. You could be killed. Uh, uh, the other one is, uh, is the, uh, the uh, long-term threat principally of cancers and other chronic diseases caused by uh, acute or chronic radiation at a low level, principally cosmic rays, the uh, high energy particles coming in from outside the uh, so solar system, which are virtually unshieldable. We don't know how much damage they do over a long period of time. We don't know what the quality factor is. Uh, uh, by which you multiply the actual deposited energy by some factor to uh, approximate the damage. And I think this is one of those risks where we will never gain great confidence by doing what we can on Earth. We're going to have to go experience it uh, in, in order to find out what the risk is. Is it worth it? Uh, I think we'd get a lot of volunteers. So to piggyback on that question, uh, what do you three feel is the greatest problem facing space travel and or space medicine today? And specifically, how could engineers help solve that problem? Well, um, I think in a, in a global sense, uh, uh, reducing the, uh, um, the, uh, the cost to orbit, uh, basically the uh, the efficiency with which we can get people and materials to and from space is the biggest technical challenge that we face. Um, as you may be aware, there, there have been about 550 people thus far who have seen uh, their home planet from space, and there are a number of companies now that are looking to make that into the thousands and tens of thousands, and I think this is a very exciting time in history when we're going to see this new commercial human spaceflight industry you know, really uh, grow by leaps and bounds. But Making the uh, uh, space travel routine, bringing the cost down, I think it's the, the biggest threat to uh, really going beyond to explore. We, as, uh, as Neil was describing, if we really want to go explore, we either have to take lots of things up with us and build it in space and, and, and launch from, from Earth orbit or maybe lunar orbit or a Lagrange point, or we have to figure out ways to create habitats that can be self-sustaining. So it's the, the biosphere type of an approach where we can grow in hydroponics uh, uh, the, the food that we need and, and all the other things that we can build in situ, uh, very challenging. Um, and I think uh, you know, the, 
the, uh, the planners that are working on these missions have, have a lot of exciting work to do. I, I think this is an exciting time to be in your field and, and uh, uh, to, to think about uh, these missions, but um, we're not going to be looking for uh, just a doctor and just a, uh, a flight engineer and just a uh, pick a, a field of science. The crews are going to have to be uh, jacks of all trades. So the physicians are also going to be the IT specialists and the machine shop people because the, uh, um, everyone's going to have to chip in in lots of different ways to, uh, to be able to adapt real time. Um, from a, a medical perspective, um, I think sending a crew to Mars is particularly challenging because of the time latency that's several minutes in each direction. So for a, a communication on a, uh, an emergent problem, uh, the crew really needs to be fairly autonomous, um, needs to be able to diagnose the, the failure and respond to it uh, fairly quickly with the resources that they have on hand because they can't re rely upon a, a mission control. And if you take that uh, to the, the medical domain, uh, if a person develops a, a surgical emergency, well, the, the docs that you have on board aren't going to be uh, current surgeons. It may have been many months, maybe even over a couple of years by the time they have to perform a, a surgery. So I think one of the great opportunities from a technical perspective is uh, um, telementoring, uh, uh, telepresence, uh, closed loop uh, assistive devices for uh, doing surgery and, and other procedural activities uh, um, in a remote environment. And then point of care diagnostics. So um, the ability to uh, um, you know, make a, a, a critical diagnosis uh, in, in a remote environment um, I think is going to be driven by environments like this and also where I work currently work in Antarctica you know the, the developing technologies first in extreme environments uh, because the need is there has great benefit then for the rest of society the, these point-of-care devices will then be deployed in family practice offices and ERs and things like that I know I've kind of digressed from uh, your original uh, question, but my, my main point is that I think there's great opportunity for, for space medicine as well as uh, great challenges for engineers. Yeah, on the engineering side, <laughs> the challenges are uh, formidable and fun. A lot of things that you can do is going to require a lot of creativity. Uh, you have uh, kind of an open book on it, but uh, healthcare technologies would be at the forefront. There got to be better ways that we can do things. We got to do them smaller and less mass. Okay, you can't bring an MRI with you up there. You can't bring certain. You know, there are, there are a lot of things that are not going to be available to us. In any event, there is a healthcare problem. Uh, the technologies have got to rise to it, and so it raises for us a series of what we do know and what we can take care of, and what we know but can't take care of, and then what we don't know and probably can't take care of. The third category is called in NASA the unknown unknowns, okay? And this is where engineers are gonna be extremely valuable because the, t the, the discipline that you have in and the rigor that you put to your development of ideas, I think is, is very, very important and it's very unmatched in science. Science looks at things very differently than engineering does. So you make a great complementary contribution to the whole concept of being able to take our, you know, humankind out of this environment, by the way, which you were well designed to survive. You take a look around at everything that's alive around you right now and just remember that 99.99 plus something percent of anything that's ever lived on this planet is extinct. Okay. And so you're well trimmed by evolution to be and live in this environment of 9.8 meters per second squared. That's acceleration due to gravity. And we have no idea what sustained life would be in microgravity or hypogravity. The gravity here is one, you know, that 9.8 and uh, or 1g in in space is 10 to the minus six. And when you get to Mars. It's three-eighths of what the planet's gravity is here. We have no idea how much gravity you need to sustain yourself. Nothing on this planet has ever had to adapt to live in a low-gravity environment because for the entire history of the planet, it's been 9.8 meters per second squared. So there's a lot for engineers to consider on how we're going to make the technologies that are available to do all the kinds of things that we talked about. 
uh, and, uh, and it has to work in several different gravitational fields. So good luck and have a good time. I'd love to be here to see you get some of that accomplishment. A word about my colleague, Dr. Pellis. Uh, when I met Neil, he was uh, managing the cell science program, the biotechnology cell science program at the Johnson Space Center at Ford NASA. And uh, I was managing the uh, support contractor for the, for the uh, life sciences. And he and his colleagues just really opened my eyes about the responses to changes in gravitational force at the cellular subcellular level. I had, we had, in the early days of the program, just written that off. You can't measure them, so other forces are going to predominate like surface tension, so forget it. Uh-uh. Uh, <laughs> and and it, was, it was wonderful. It was seeing nature in 3D or something. Uh, he ran a program which uh, developed a biotechnology facility that was to launch and fly on the International Space Station. and do marvelous experiments in all this thing. And, uh, and we were going to build it. And it was designed, and we were starting to, uh, to manufacture it, and the headquarters canceled the program, which is one of the problems about doing something like going to Mars. How do you get your, your, uh, your supporter, the government, to uh, uh, keep its mind on one thing for more than one term? Uh, it's, a little, it's a little tough. Now, I answer this, uh, uh, what are the main problems? You've, you've, you've heard some of, some of the good ones. Uh, and, uh, you know, medically, uh, sure, it's, it's radiation, uh, it's uh, enough exercise as a, as a countermeasure, it's how do you uh, stop your bones from, uh, from thinning out, is there an equilibrium that they will reach, uh, and it's uh, this recent problem in increased intracranial pressure that we've seen in some of the station astronauts, which may prove to be a, a conundrum long term. Uh, but. Uh, take a different view of it. Uh, imagine that uh, that 10 years I talked about has passed and they're about to close the door and this is the launch vehicle. Look around you and those are your crewmates, okay? Uh, what's, what's on your wish list as the Marriott Hotel begins to rumble and, uh, and ascend into space? Uh, the first thing you want is reliable hardware. Uh, not only propulsion but life support uh, and, uh, and all the other things. That, that you've got to go with you. You're going to be gone for a couple of years. You want that stuff to work. You want it to be redundant. You want it to be repairable. And you want to know how to repair it and all those things. Uh, and that's, I just talked a lot of engineering. Uh, the second thing is you want those people on your left and on your right to, to, to make up a capable and competitive and, and compatible crew with you. And that's very important. Uh, you will have worked together for a long time. Hopefully you will you will uh, have adjusted to one another and have the same goals in mind and be stable, grown-up people who can go longer than, uh, than a few months uh, without developing cabin fever and uh, beginning to hate one another and breaking up into, uh, into uh, uh, groups and, and so on and so forth. Uh, big issue. And uh, lastly, I'll say, uh, if I get sick, can they take care of me? Can they cure me? Can they, uh, can they do my thing? It's been touched on already, but it's telemedicine. And, uh, and that, too, was going to require just exactly what this conference is talking about, an intersection between engineering, medicine, and healthcare. So where do you think NASA should be headed? And necessarily, does that include public-private partnership with SpaceX, Bigelow, Boeing? Uh, personal preference uh, would be for NASA uh, to, of course, to support with facilities and, uh, and, and, and stuff, commercial enterprises in space, and I think that, th that those are very important, but should remain independent of the government for the most part. They should have the relationship to, to government that United Airlines has to the FAA, okay? The FAA doesn't run United Airlines, it just empowers it to, uh, to fly about the country. Uh, and, uh, and that NASA should concern itself with going out in deep space missions and, and with the great observatories and the other unmanned things that we do. Right on. I, I agree. Uh, NASA's mission should first and foremost be about exploration and push, pushing technology. And I think we, you know, with the uh, uh, this decade's worth of uh, experience that we have in, in uh, space flight already, that it is time to turn over at least the low Earth orbit uh, part of that equation, the, the resupply and and uh, management of that to to other companies, and they're doing this brilliantly. You may have uh, seen the news of SpaceX just uh, uh, landing their second vehicle uh, to and from the International Space Station. 
Orbital is about to do the same, I think, in, in March. Uh, other companies are lining up to, to supply the space station. So this is, you know, the, uh, uh, the advent of uh, the commercial uh, spaceflight era. Just as at the turn of the last century, we, we began with uh, you know, experimental uh, aircraft leading to the, the post and military, and ultimately it became a commercial service. And now we can, uh, on the internet, uh, buy a ticket pretty much anywhere on the planet and be there within 24 hours, which is incredible to think of how far we've come in a century. And uh, so I just, my mind uh, is, is boggled by where we might be a century from now in terms of the use of commercial spaceflight. Uh, it might even be uh, you know, commercial suborbital uh, ballistic travel skipping across the top of the atmosphere and going from Houston to Tokyo in 45 minutes uh, you know, in, in a few decades. And I think that will happen. But ultimately, um, uh, we do need to have NASA looking beyond. Um, I, I've always been troubled uh, by the, the term commercial sp space, however, because Space has always been commercial. NASA uh, lets contracts to commercial companies and companies like Boeing and Lockheed, big aerospace companies, but uh, commercial companies nonetheless with a, the intent to make a, a profit uh, as well as do good work, uh, have done that work. And so um, what we're seeing now in new space is smaller uh, companies uh, with big, big visions and, and some good funding taking some new approaches. Um, and I think that's, that's really good for um, the industry as well as for this country because uh, most of the companies that are in the leadership, you know, the pole position of uh, uh, commercial human spaceflight are American companies. Well, I can't disagree with anything there uh, uh, with regard to the participation of commercial. I'll add one thing about commercial. It's essential. We know this <coughs> because, uh, in fact, you know, the government can be a good driver in setting demands and needs and requirements for commercial achievement. And I guess probably the best explanation is going from barnstorm flying, flying you know, to real flying and commercial flying. And that happened because the government got interested in the fact that you could get mail from Washington, D.C. to Cincinnati in the same day just by flying it rather than, <clears throat> than taking it by rail. And so it was, that's what really made aviation change. That was the dramatic change brought about in the 20s when the, when the government actually went to air mail. And that's what drove it. And we're going to do the same thing. I think the government provides a drive, but I think the innovation itself and the actual re uh, the development, production, uh, and actually operation is by the commercial side. I think it's very important. And I'll give you one, one comparator to think about. Just see if you could imagine right now what an automobile would look like if all of those aspects, the conceptualization, design, development, manufacture, marketing, and operation, what would an automobile look like if that was exclusively the government's venue? It would be a Hummer. <laughs> <laughs> so what has been, to switch to more uh, personal side, what has been the most surprising part of your career thus far, either in space or working on uh, space-related technologies? Well, I've had uh, you know the, the good fortune to, to fly uh, on five missions, uh, uh, all of which were very, very different, touching on life sciences and, and uh, uh, assembly and maintenance, uh, um, atmospheric science, uh, um, working with wonderful people from around the country as well as international partners around the world. And I guess one of the, the, the unique uh, uh, experiences in my life was the uh, the participation in the Shuttle Mir program. Uh, I was uh, selected after my first flight to go live aboard the Russian space station Mir for about four and a half months. Uh, kind of a funny story, so I um, was very excited about the adventure going to live in Star City, Russia, which is a former a Russian Air Force base, uh, top secret at, uh, up until uh, right before then. Um, very few people, except I guess the Skylab, uh, or the, uh, the Apollo Soyuz test project folks, had ever been to see this place, and so to get a to be a uh, you know a red, white, and blue American to, to go uh, live and train there, to learn how to speak Russian and, and work hand in hand with Russian cosmonauts was really a, a great thrill for me, um, and uh, I guess the uh, the the striking thing about that whole experience was uh, um, the the fear that we had had. Um, 
unfounded, as I, I later found out, um, was based on just the way we were raised and uh, you know the, the the limited understanding that we had of their culture and their technologies. But I expected it uh, the uh, Gagarin uh, Cosmonaut Training Center to be this you know this mecca, you know, highly uh, technical and uh, you know polished uh, you know gold plated streets and it was actually pretty run down as it, as it turned out and uh, you know fairly uh, fairly basic place but uh, the uh, the technical solutions that each uh, country brought uh, to, to conquer space were similar in many ways but also very different and so the the American way of engineering is to um, understand the the engineering principles uh, to, to do the design to, um, to have a, a failure uh, tolerance uh, for failure of a certain calculated uh, percentage and uh, design to that and, and test to it. But the Russian approach was to basically build it like a, a, a brick, uh, brick house or a bomb and then uh, try and blow it up and if it doesn't blow up then it's probably good enough. And so yeah, the, you, to see the Russian hardware, the, the welds that uh, were put into these things, uh, the, the way that the, uh, the, the Russian capsules had evolved uh, really to this day are really a, a, just an incremental evolution from Yuri Gagarin's capsule in uh, Vostok 1. I mean, it's, it's, very, it, it's, it's very robust, uh, very simple, tried and true, and it, it's, a, it's a good way to do things, you know, um, especially if you're going into a really harsh, unforgiving environment. The, the U.S. space program evolved very differently. We, we did press technologies in many different ways. The space shuttle, the most complex uh, flying vehicle ever assembled, um, you know, revolutionary in its, its uh, approach to, uh, to getting to large volumes as well as multiple people up uh, and back from space. So it's just very interesting to be a part of that whole evolution. The, and I'll, I know I've been talking too long here, but the funny story uh, uh, was that uh, I went to uh, Star City uh, kind of as a a guinea pig, a, a test case. So I, I'm about 6'3 when I don't slouch. And uh, so uh, we're looking to use the Soyuz capsule in an emergency for the International Space Station. So they're hoping that I could fit into the Soyuz capsule in an emergency uh, at the Russian Space Station. Turns out I was too tall. So I ended up, uh, after five months of training there, getting pulled back to Houston. I got a new nickname, uh, Too Tall Perezinski, uh, because I, I couldn't use this capsule. Um, Ultimately, uh, NASA contracted with the Russians to expand the anthropometric uh, uh, limits of this capsule, and we do use this Soyuz capsule for, for big goons like me. But <laughs> wants to take it if I if I hadn't slouched during NASA's physical exam, they would have rejected me from the program. <laughs> I was six feet at that time. Uh, anyway, biggest surprises on the flight. It was probably not getting motion sick. Uh, it was probably being immune to motion sickness. Uh, we, both we and the Russians had had instances of uh, space motion sickness, which the scientists began to call space adaptation syndrome. But we called it DSMS, for dreaded space motion sickness. And, uh, and uh, about a third of, of people are, are affected. Uh, and, uh, and so Skylab being the big medical experiment uh, flight, they launched with a rotating chair, which was designed to determine what happens to your threshold for motion sickness after you've become adapted to weightlessness. It was a nasty machine. You would sit in this chair and it would spin up to an agreed to RPM based on your pre-flight testing. Okay, we, we did a lot of negotiation. And when it was at that RPM, you would start moving your head in and out of the plane of rotation in such a way that each and every one of your semicircular canals was was displeased. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the object was to get to approximately 75 groups of head motions before the nausea was bad enough that you had to quit. And so we all got calibrated that way. And then we went to fly and we had a kind of exciting first five or six days and we got behind on adaptation and it was about day six before we got to strap ourselves into the chair and start that thing rotating up and, oh well, here goes. Nothing happened. We, no cold sweat, no nausea, none of those awful symptoms that, that you're about to, to throw up. Uh, when the chair stopped, you did have a little nystagmus, a little, little back and forth of the eyes, that was it. And we increased uh, my uh, my uh, standard RPM had been seven and a half. The chair was capable of going to 30. Uh, we ended up going to 30 with the same result. 
once you've adapted to motion sickness on orbit, you appear to be immune from it. And that has interesting engineering uh, uh, implications on spacecraft for long-term and interplanetary missions. So I think that was kind of neat. It's hard to top that kind <laughs> and this is not any experience in space, but at, as a scientist, uh, things that struck me, and actually Joe already alluded to this, that uh, for many years, <clears throat> cells were, and microbes were considered too insignificant in mass. When you look at relativity equals mc squared, m is very, very small when you're talking about a cell. The mass is so small. And that it was theorized that it would not be affected by the loss of gravity and that it would be more other environmental conditions created by microgravity would actually induce the change. Uh, and we're still fighting right now to find out which one changes it. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we know that cells do change and do have very, very specific responses when they go to microgravity. And there are things that happen that we can actually see and then we can also measure and we can look in the DNA and we can see gene expression changes. Things that we had never imagined were going to happen. And it also provoked trying to understand that if it, the cell can actually in some way respond to the change in environment, that is the physical change, then it must have some kind of transducing system for it. And indeed they do. They have mechanosensitive channels and they're in a lot of your cells. Uh, and we now know a lot more about mechanosensitive channels because of not only the space program, but a lot of interest in them in the cardiovascular system and other systems of the body. They can range from in their ability to sense anything from the piconewton range down into the femtonewton range. And there are other cellular structures now that we know for sure that are, 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 are sensory systems for forces. They've been known for a long time or theorized for that, but I think they have a play a role in space and how some of these responses go in space, particularly the one Joe was just talking about, okay? with his semicircular canals. What happens to the fluid in your semicircular canals when you're in space? Because right now it's resting down here, okay? It goes anywhere surface tension takes it, okay? And the cells that line those canals have these sensory structures on them, these cilia. And they're not modal cilia, they're, they're a different kind of cilia. But they, and that's what's happening. It is a big surprise to me that you could see at this small level of life, Okay, this very, very small level of life that there is a profound effect by microgravity. Sometimes it's translated through by changing the fluid in the environment or changing conditions in the environment, but the cells can sense that system. So it's about time to start, I mean, I have a list of questions I personally would like to ask, but it's about time to open it up to the audience. Uh, does anyone have any question in particular? I'm always curious uh, what kind of medical equipment the astronauts had in the you know, space station. Yeah, the space station has a pretty capable uh, a bevy of tools. It's uh, a, a quite a comp complement of uh, um, the pharmacy. Uh, we have airway management, uh, uh, suture uh, materials, uh, uh, suction, um, you know, basic uh, urgent care center type uh, level of uh, uh, care. Um, we're really not uh, capable of conducting surgery up in space. In fact, I think it'd be very, very challenging. I'm interested to hear uh, Joe's perspective on this, but um, we don't have the, the enclosures and the, the way to uh, uh, control airflow uh, in particular. There's, uh, if, if this room were in, in space at this, at this point, uh, there'd be all sorts of particulate in the air. You know, the, the hair uh, follicles and, and skin and, and so on uh, uh, falls to the ground here in a 1G environment, but up in space, unless you have a really uh, brisk uh, uh, airflow, uh, it's it's all going to be floating around uh, that, that could uh, contaminate a surgical field. So we really aren't set up to do surgery in microgravity at this point. Um, but we do have pretty good diagnostic capability. We have ultrasound. Um, we have uh, uh, telemetry, uh, uh, EKG. Um, we have other telemedicine uh, cameras that we could uh, download to the uh, uh, flight surgeons and mission control. So uh, that, that's kind of the scope of what we have now. 
it was kind of fun in Skylab because it was the first NASA mission in which there was going to be medical experiments and a priority for medicine and possibly a physician flying. Uh, and, and it was also fun for me to be very much involved uh, with my fellow crewmen in the design and development of Skylab as well as just the training and flying for it. it it's, its design started the several months after I arrived at NASA, so I had a lot of assignments to go help with this and that. One of them was development of the medical kit, the in-flight medical support system, as it was called. And uh, there was a, you know, an obvious need for certain basic uh, diagnostic uh, uh, gear and for, cert for certain basic drugs. Uh, we added a little more sophisticated diagnostic gear, uh, the otoscope and the ophthalmoscope. We added some simple laboratory tests, red cell count, white cell count, stuff like that. Uh, we got to a kit which had a lot of stuff in it that we were not going to want to train pilots to use. And I had the interesting task of writing a letter to my boss, Deke Slayton, trying to justify having that stuff up there when I hadn't yet been assigned to the crew, okay? <laughs> but I managed. And uh, uh, basically, we, you know, we went up there with, uh, with, with, with the equipment we knew we were going to need eventually, and we wanted to play with it. And we divided it into Group A, which all the Skylab astronauts were, uh, us, were, were trained on to some extent. We, we managed to carve out 80 hours of medical training time for the pilots. That's two full weeks of employment. It's not a whole lot of time. Uh, but we, we taught them to extract teeth, and they did some. Uh, and uh, to perform the diagnostic things and then, you know, uh, know the language well enough to tell Houston what they found out so Houston could say what to do. And, uh, and then there was equipment labeled B, which means only Kerwin gets to play with this. <laughs> it was fun. I'll just add one quick uh, story. So uh, I was always the only physician on the cruise that I flew. So typically it was a fighter pilot who was my physician, my, my scheduled you know, physician. So it's a great incentive to stay healthy on my flights. <laughs> Questions? Just tell them. Go ahead. Um, I understand that when astronauts return after a long, particularly long space flight, that they would have difficulty walking. Um, are there things that are done to address that when you get back, or, or do you just wait it out until you get back to normal gait? Yeah, I'll start with Skylab, which went uh, one 28-day mission, one 59-day mission, and one 84-day mission, uh, uh, one, two, and three months roughly. Uh, all of us experienced some adaptation problems on return. Part of that was vestibular. Uh, we, you know, we had this sailor's gait where you, you, you can kind of expect the world to be rolling, and it's not. Uh, part of it was the fact that we had all lost uh, a, a couple of pints of blood, maybe eight or ten pounds worth of body fluid, uh, and we were, we were a little vertiginous. Uh, it, there was a tendency to pass out in the shower during Apollo. Uh, basically, at, in that era, we didn't have a, a rehab program. We just, uh, we just adapted to life as quick as we could and, uh, and got back to exercising and flying in a week or two. Yeah, so we've learned a lot from the early uh, pioneers to the point where we have a, a number of countermeasures that bring us back in reasonably good shape, especially after a short duration flight. We, um, we fluid load as well as uh, ingest some salt to try and hold that uh, uh, fluid load in our circulation, at least for the, the challenge of landing. And on the shuttle, we would wear a G-suit so that we could uh, fly the shuttle, land it, and uh, get up after uh, landing and do an emergency egress if we need to. It's a little bit more challenging now for the uh, the space station crew members who are up there for six months at a, at a shot. Um, but they're exercising about two hours a day. Uh, resistive exercise we found is very, very important, keeping that uh, muscle tone as well as vascular tone. And then additionally to have the, uh, the cardiovascular challenge uh, during the long duration mission. So um, they come back in, in reasonably good shape. In fact, we've had a couple of astronauts who've come back with greater bone density in the, in the calcaneus and uh, in the lung bones and, and the, the vertebrae because they were so busy in their, uh, their final months of training that they kind of got out of shape. So the right before flight, they took their baseline data collection and they weren't in the best shape of their lives, but they, 
they actually came back in really good shape. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, there is a, a real challenge uh, for folks when they first get back uh, onto the ground. Uh, and you may have seen the, the Soyuz landings uh, in Kazakhstan. They, they kind of carry the folks out and they put them in a nice uh, uh, Kazakh uh, chair and, and gradually readapt to, to 1G. Um, the, the instruction is to take it very gradually. Um, you're, you're in a physical um, rehabilitation program for uh, about four to six months. Uh, starting with you know just light walks and and uh, swim aerobics uh, they, they tend to do and and gradually increasing the the load we've had a number of folks come back and, and press it too quickly and uh, have injuries so we've had some c-spine injuries and uh, I think Achilles tendon problems and and so uh, you know, the body does need its time to, to readapt yeah it's uh, in microgravity you lose about 1% of your bone mass per month uh, if and that varies from astronaut to astronaut and, and there's a varied experience and some people require extensive rehabilitation others require less when I say extensive it's extensive relative to the curve that they have these guys are all in pretty damn good shape and so that you know that they, they, they don't get so debilitated but some require more than others and I think uh, that uh, uh, one of the interesting things that you need to know is your cardiovascular system doesn't change the same way your bone does. You get some degrading in cardiovascular performance and it reaches a new level in space which we call space normal which is really, uh, I, I abhor that term but that's the term that's used. But it seems to stay there but bone does not, bone continues to go. So the longer you're in space the more careful we are about how we're going to rehab people. And there are a lot of different aspects to this. I mean, the neurovestibular things that you guys were talking about before, that's the semicircular canals, the otoliths, the little stones in your, in your ears that rest on the hair cells that tell you whether or not you're falling, the proprioceptors in the back of your legs, which are telling your brain that you're standing and you're being pushed against the earth by the gravity of the earth. Well, all of those signals to your brain are changed immediately when you go to space. And some of the confusion is even facilitated by the fact that all the fluid that's in your blood vessels and in your tissue, so the intravascular and interstitial tissue, as, uh, right, uh, fluids all head up into your chest and face, and that's why they have the puffy face. And that's why when Joe said we had less fluid when we came back, it's because your body responds to that and says, I got too much fluid, so it sends it out the normal channel that it goes, okay? And, and in doing so, you lose fluid, and relatively, you don't lose as much in the way of red blood cells right away. So your blood cells, you have actually more blood cells per unit volume for a short period of time, and the body's homeostatic mechanism says we need to get rid of those. And so, they, and so you begin to lose red blood cell mass, as they call it. It's actually the real absolute number of red blood cells. And so when you come back, you have a bit of an anemic condition. You're hypovolemic, which means you have less fluid than you should. And that's why he talked about fluid loading and drinking a lot of fluid to try to see if they can obviate some of that. All of that notwithstanding, you come back and... Uh, I know that a number of things happen you know, that you can talk about, especially the gait and all that, but there are also what we call flashbacks, and sometimes a few days, five, you know, even a week later, uh, an astronaut will take a, an off-ramp on, uh, on a uh, uh, freeway and pull you know, a little bit of G going around that ramp, and they'll get a flashback and have to pull over and stop and sit. And, you know, get reoriented so that they can go back and drive again. So there are a lot of nuances to getting back together and, 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 you know, and getting your body to realize, you know, hey, we're in 9.8 meters per second squared now and we got to get everything straight again. One quick uh, funny story. So one of my uh, crewmates on his first flight, uh, he had grown accustomed to living and working in space. And of course, you, you live and work uh, in whatever body orientation you're you happen to float into so you, you drink upside down you you, you lie in your you sleep on your side it, it doesn't matter there's no up or down left right forwards or back it's just whatever way your body happens to be so he's on landing day on his uh, couch watching some TV having a, a sip of Mountain Dew and then he just naturally sets his can of Mountain Dew right on his chest and uh, you can imagine what happened after that. <laughs> we probably have time for one last question Um, <laughs> but uh, but that aside, uh, um, can you talk 
little more about that, maybe in terms of, uh, I know NASA does a lot of uh, pre-screening before they pick astronauts when it comes to psychological screening. But, uh, I imagine that would be you know, a real issue when you're talking about the years. It's going to be on really long flights. Uh, I, you know, again, in the in in the olden days, the the kind of screening that NASA did sort of automatically corrected for serious problems with with uh, with accepting risk and getting along, playing well with others. Uh, you know, uh, you were uh, you were uh, up in your 30s. Uh, you were probably married. Uh, you were a, a, certainly a pilot and probably a test pilot with a lot of hours. You had held a job. You'd, you know, you, you'd exhibited some emotional ma maturity. Then we had very long training programs. We had a military command style, uh, and, uh, and we, we, we had a great convergence of goals. We were all interested in doing exactly the same thing on those flights, you know, to the extent that we fought to get on them. Uh, and all that militated against our having in-flight problems even if there were com uh, ch uh, some incompatibilities in personality. And there were, and they were suppressed and, and uh, didn't, didn't arise. I think on longer missions, all of these things are, are going to have more opportunity to, to give trouble, and that the crews, therefore, are going to have to be selected, perhaps self-selected to, to some degree, uh, and trained and, and people weed it out if necessary who don't fit the rest of the crew uh, so that uh, because when you when you when the Marriott takes us all on the way to Mars we're going to be our own country we're, we're we are our own legislators our own Supreme Court we're going to make the rules and enforce them uh, because nobody else can help us until we get back to earth so it is important well it's a great question and you know, I'm a, a shuttle astronaut I never really flew a long duration flight so I would always tell people when I ask this question, you can get along with anyone for a couple of weeks. And so, um, but I, I would also echo uh, Joe's comment that it was a highly uh, selected, focused group with a, a common goal of a, a mission, be it a space station assembly or a science mission. So, um, never experienced any any real conflict in in the environments that I worked on my my flights. But it's it's much more difficult, I think, as we you know. Uh, continue on with the International Space Station program and then go uh, on these uh, multi-year missions uh, to Mars and beyond. Um, complicated by the fact that it's multinational and so it, it, the, the cultural sensitivities uh, that we have to learn about, um, you know, English is the the official language of the International Space Station program. However, to be uh, social, to be um, uh, to be good citizens, uh, and we all learn to speak Russian, uh, and this includes, uh, we have Japanese and, and uh, European colleagues, so they're actually taxed with learning additional languages, both English and Russian, so that we can all kind of meld together, but it, it's, it's much more difficult when you don't have the, uh, uh, the, the cultural uh, underpinnings uh, um, that uh, you know, we had in the, in the early shuttle program. And I, I don't think that uh, we should even consider, um, you know, these these lofty goals of going to Mars as a as just a nation, and it, I don't think we could even afford it even if we wanted to. So this will be an international uh, endeavor, and so um, I think the uh, the screening is going to take place in analog environments. Um, one of the our uh, audience members has done a Knowles uh, uh, trip in the National Outdoor Leadership School. It's one of the training environments that we use at NASA to bring our crews together. And so we take a shuttle crew or a space station crew and throw them out into the wilderness for, for many days. And you develop uh, your, your team style, you develop uh, different, you, you establish uh, leadership styles and uh, you exchange leadership roles throughout the course of this expedition. And it, you really come together as a crew and also see what works and, and what doesn't. Um, I think we're going to have to do more and more of that as we, we think about these multi-year uh, trips. Uh, and I'm a little bit biased, but uh, now that I'm working in the Antarctic program, I think um, it's a great test bed. It's a real world, real threat environment uh, where you have to uh, look out not only for yourself, but your, your teammates and, and uh, the decisions that you make have real impact uh, on your, your survival. So it'll be interesting to see how NASA approaches that. Yeah, this has been an interesting problem that's, uh, that's gotten much more attention in the science side of this uh, over the last 10 years. 
and uh, you know the concern as to what you you know how well we can get along a, a, in a small group dynamic and there are experiences there are a lot of experiences and Scott just pointed to the you know Antarctic in those places uh, but uh, Keep in mind, I think that, that the screening for some of the Antarctic studies doesn't come near the stringency that it does for this. And so you've selected beyond that crowd. Because there are things that strange. People do get strange when they live in small groups and they live where the sun's not coming up and going down. There's a whole lot in your brain that is geared to the fact that it does that for varying times during, uh, you know, during the course of the year. The other thing that I know uh, that remains an enigma to NASA is that we have periodic experiences where there are cog cognitive deficits that occur when people are in space for a long period of time. You can ask them a question, and it's a dissociative type thing. What I mean by that is, is that you ask a person a question, they already know the answer, they cannot execute the answer. Okay, or you ask them to do something and they, they, it takes them, there's a delayed time until you can get a satisfactory execution uh, of what, what was desired. It's not rampant, but it does occur, and we don't know what it's related to. There are a lot of thoughts about uh, the intracranial pressure or the cephalid fluid shift, and there are a number of things that come about with it. Uh, sleep deprivation, we didn't talk about that, but how, you know, these guys, these guys really get hammered. Uh, with regard to how they change the number of hours in the work day and the number of uh, hours in the day depending on what activities are going to be done when uh, on the space station and so and it's very very disrupting and believe it or not if you look at real performance tests on people on the ground that are done like this you'd be surprised people in sleep deprivation never think that they're doing anything wrong they think they're performing absolutely fine and yet they're so far off norm it's unbelievable and I've personally experienced it myself at an old age, about 63 or 64 years old. I went on a trip, one of these crazy trips like you guys are talking about. We were sleep deprived, and I can tell you by Wednesday, and we started on Sunday, by Wednesday I thought I was doing everything absolutely correctly, and I was doing nothing right. <laughs> so we're actually five minutes past time, but if you're willing to stick around for a minute or two, I know a couple people have extra questions, but uh, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah.